All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, Trans and Non-Binary Sexual Health and Pregnancy. For your information, all participants' microphones are muted today. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to be addressed after the presentation, please use the Q&A box that's located in your Zoom toolbar. The chat box is also available if you have any comments or technical questions today, and if you would like to participate in the presentation. My name is Savannah Holt. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program Coordinator with the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. The Prevention Institute is a provincial nonprofit organization that is located in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Our organizational focus is to reduce disabling conditions in children using primary prevention methods. We raise awareness by providing training, information, and resources based on current best evidence. We believe that all children, regardless of ability, have the right to the best physical, social, and emotional health possible. We work in a variety of, a variety of areas, including sexual and reproductive health, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder prevention, maternal and infant health, early childhood mental health, child injury prevention, child traffic safety, and parenting. One focus of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program is to provide evidence-based information on sexual and reproductive health that is accessible to healthcare practitioners and allied health professionals. In recent years, transgender and gender diverse people have experienced significant advancements in societal acceptance. However, ongoing and pervasive stigma and discrimination, as well as limited knowledge related to gender diverse health, have made it challenging for many people to access quality affirming health care. Today's presentation will explore important topics in the area of transgender and gen gender non-conforming sexual health and pregnancy care, so that we can all work together to create safer, affirming, and positive care experiences for everyone that we work with. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Megan Clark, pronouns she and her, is a family physician in Regina, Saskatchewan. As part of her comprehensive family medicine practice, she provides primary care to trans and gender diverse clients for whom she provides surgical referrals, hormone therapy, and gender affirming general family medicine care. She teaches at the University of Saskatchewan um, to the medical students and family medicine res residents at the Regina Family Medicine Unit Academic Clinic. She's proud to participate in the Saskatchewan Trans Health Coalition. Her other clinical interests include palliative care, addictions medicine, inner city health, indigenous health, and sexual health. And now for today's presentation, transgender and non-binary sexual health and pregnancy. Thank you for joining us, Megan. Thank you so much. I am excited to be here and I'm excited to see that there's so many people that are excited to learn about this. So I will share what I know. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction. I think I can just get started. Um, throughout the presentation, yes, please do use the Q&A, which uh, Savannah is going to moderate on my behalf. There are a couple places for audience participation and I'll watch the chat box for that. Um, so. Let's get going here. So first of all, my disclosures. I have no financial disclosures to put forward for today. Um, on my behalf, the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute has kindly donating, making some donation to some of our local um, community-based organizations that work with sexually and gender diverse folks. And my other disclosure for this presentation is I did no, no formal training in trans and gender diverse healthcare during my residency. Um, I do attend conferences and read papers and guidelines, however, and but that being said, I am self-taught and I am still learning both about hormone therapy and about culturally safe care, as we all are in this area era when we are challenging our biases. Objectives, what I hope you to be able to do at the end of this presentation. Um, to appreciate the importance of trans health issues, talk, uh, learn a bit about cultural safety, um, talking about diagnoses of gender dysphoria versus gender incongruence, depending which professional body you ask, we'll talk about that. Starting to approach resources in Saskatchewan for trans clients, and then describe aspects of social, medical, and legal, or social, medical, and surgical transition, sorry, 
and then discuss unique considerations for trans people in some reproductive health areas of concern, including fertility, preservation, pregnancy, and contraception. Um, talking just a little bit about screening processes in terms of uh, reproductive and general health screening for trans clients and starting to direct clients, patients, people you know, to websites and local resources. As a physician, I think there are some challenges with the word patient. It implies a very passive and not necessarily person-centered relationship, but that is what is ingrained in my training and my mind. So you might prefer the term client or just person, please sub it in. Um, outline for the presentation today, I expect to be talking for about 45 minutes and have time for a Q&A period at the end. We'll talk about a bit of the context for trans and gender diverse people in society right now, talking about supporting a trans person in general, including through trans related medical care. And then at the end, we'll talk um, more about the unique reproductive health considerations as part of trans related medical care. And then I have a couple of slides for local resources at the end. So first of all, I think the general societal and psychological impacts of um, for trans and gender diverse people are important and more and more coming to the forefront. I got into this work because when I was a second year resident in Regina and I'm USASC trained both for medical school and my family medicine residency, there was a client who presented to me at the family medicine unit, the second year residents see their own slate of patients for a medication renewal. It turned out that was for her hormone therapy and she's still my patient. So I worked with her to follow her through her transition um, and she, as part of her transition, had hormone therapy and a gender affirming surgery. Um, and that is how I got into this work and learned about it. Um, so I think that um, in our society, in many societies, gender diversity was part of many cultures, just not necessarily part of a cis, white, patriarchal, privileged, heteronormative type of society that came to prominence with colonialism and in the West. Studies now show that up to 0.6 to 1.2% of the population uh, report to identify as trans, as transgender. And there are some important Canadian studies around mental health in people who are trans and gender diverse, especially around youth. So there is a trans pulse project. They actually did their survey nationally in the summer of 2019, um, but their original search survey was done for 433 people in Ontario um, over 10 years ago now. And it found that 57% of trans youth who were not supported by their parents attempted suicide in the past year, but there was a 93% reduction in suicide attempts. I think as Savannah mentioned in the introduction, folks who are trans and gender diverse do still experience discrimination. Unfortunately, I hear those stories from my patients much more frequently than I would like to. And we know that mental health outcomes um, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts are more common among people who are trans and gender diverse. And I think largely be because of societal, lack of societal acceptance and discrimination. Although of course things are improving and we've still got places to go. There is an important need, I think, for psychological care before, during, and after transition, just like there's an important need for psychological care for all of us, for people of all genders and of all sexualities. Specifically in Regina, we've got Celeste Selferling at Monarch Mental Health through UR Pride um, out of Family Service Regina. And there's a second psychologist um, who's just hired on now there too. And people, if you just Google Monarch Mental Health, you can find that and contact them online. Sherry Rapley is a psychologist at Rancherlo in Regina uh, with a sliding scale payment. She is currently on mat leave. Um, and then we do have two psychiatrists in Saskatchewan that work specifically with people who are trans and gender diverse, including for out of province gender affirming surgical approvals, which I'll talk about later. That's Dr. Sarah Dungable in Saskatoon and Dr. Sam Salou in Regina. Of course, they both do have significant wait lists as unfortunately all of our psychiatrists do in Saskatchewan. Hormonal treatment has been thought, um, has been shown to lead to better psychological quality of life, less depression, less anxiety, less suicide attempts. When you start people who are trans and gender diverse who want hormone therapy on hormone therapy, Another important finding worth mentioning of the TransPulse study is that they found that youth were actually most likely to think about suicide if they had decided they wanted hormone therapy in that planning period. 
And I think as we work against discrimination towards destigmatization and depathologization in society, we'll improve service access and improve mental health outcomes for people who are trans and gender diverse in general. A common question that I get when I'm talking with maybe family members or even the family medicine residents or medical students that I train is, do people regret their transition? There have been some studies done and they found, find that there is a very low rate of regret, um, one to 2%. The Sherburn guidelines are the trans health guidelines out of Ontario that I'll talk about more in a bit. Um, but this regret, interestingly, in the study was not qualitatively found to not necessarily be about starting hormone therapy. This was a US study done several years ago, but possibly regret about life circumstances or impacts of medical transition. So I started to transition and then my mom wouldn't talk to me or I lost my job as a result of that. Um, increasingly, in Canada and worldwide, we're seeing our general professional bodies come out with statements of support of supporting gender diversity. So this is the Canadian Family Physician Journal and then, then the American and, Pediatric, and Canadian Pediatric Societies that state to support gender diversity and gender identity. And the Endocrine Society, which is an international body specifically, has come out not only in a statement of support, but also a how-to guide for guidelines for hormone therapy. And those are publicly accessible online. So I've mentioned the um, Endocrine Society guidelines. Specifically in Canada, we've got the Sherburne Health guidelines out of Ringo Health, Ontario. These were new, a new edition in December of 2019, which is your how-to guide for hormone therapy, surgical referrals, and gender-affirming care. These are the Endocrine Society ones. And then there is also the University of, of California, San Fran Center in Trans Health Excellence, which has some of the longest experience in working with um, patients or clients who are trans and gender diverse that have their own uh, set of guidelines as well. And there are other sets of guidelines from other bodies as well, but I would say these two, the Endocrine Society and the Sherburn ones are the ones that I personally refer to and use the most. And the Sherburn ones are the most up-to-date Canadian ones at the moment. There's also some out of BC. So here is my first place for audience interaction to keep you awake and engaged in this time of Zoom. Um, so this is a bit of a matching game. So the questions are, what's, what of these? So of this on the outside, this, this, and this is assigned sex versus gender expression, gender identity, and who people are attracted to. So what's the difference between sex, gender, and sexual attraction is essentially what this is asking. So I'm just gonna watch in the chat. And yes, I'm happy for my slides to be shared. I think Savannah's got a copy. I just fixed one typo. So if folks want to guess in the chat what assigned sex is. So is that the thought bubble, the hearts, the DNA, or the outer green dots? Good. And then how about gender expression? Which one of those? And gender identity, the thought bubble, the hearts, the DNA, or the green dotted line. Good. And who people are attracted to, exam personship process of elimination at this point. <laughs> oh, excellent. Somebody gave me a comprehensive answer. Thank you so much. Great. So I'll move on to my next slide here. So I think what I was seeing in the chat was all correct. Gender identity is, is the rainbow in the head. So female, woman, girl, man, man, or boy, other genders, fluid between genders, non-binary, somewhere in between spectrum. Um, gender expression would be your outer expression. So um, feminine, masculine, both other genders or different depending on the day. Um, sex assigned at birth, yes, is has to do with the DNA, the chromosomes, genitalia, male, female, other or intersex. And then the hearts are physically and emotionally attracted to men, women, other genders, both all genders. 
So components of trans-friendly practice, I think this applies to all healthcare professionals, is to always ask and not assume. I think it's important to ask a patient and use their own terms. Trans, uh, I think, is quite a common one and is thought to be an umbrella term, but I have had the odd person whose gender is different from the gender assigned based on their sex at birth um, that don't identify with or use the word trans. Um, trans men, trans women is quite common that you'll see male or female, often people will tell you. Transsexual is no longer a term that's accepted by everybody in the community. It's kind of more of a medical, old medical term for people who are transitioning, but I've seen some people use and reclaim that term, but I wouldn't use that for everyone. Gender queer means kind of gender different from the cisgender norm. Non-binary means not one gender or the other. A famous non-binary person is Jonathan Ben Ness from Queer Eye. If anybody is as big of a fan of them as I am, um, two-spirit is an indigenous term and I don't really feel as a white cis settler lady to be the right person to be explaining what two-spirit two means, but it mean, um, in general, it's sort of an indigenous term that encompasses gender and sexual diversity. Gender fluid means moving between genders or there may be other gender identities that patients use. And I think it's important as part of a general practice towards cultural safety to ask questions, maintain curiosity and learn about all of those because there's so much knowledge that our clients have which is the best part of my job is, is learning from other people's life experiences and knowledge. Very important to ask people what their pronouns are. What are your pronouns? My, mine are she and her. Um, and when I see a new trans client, I ask everybody in the room if it's a youth who came with their parent, if it's somebody who brought their partner or a support person, I think it's very important to ask the pronouns of everybody in the room and to normalize that process. I also think it's very important not to assume partners. So not everybody who is trans or gender diverse is going to identify as queer from a sexuality perspective. They might be, be straight and have um, partners of the opposite gender. From a contraceptive and reproductive health um, standpoint, it's of course very important, and we'll talk about this more later, to ask about what types of sex they're having and the gender and genitalia of their partners. For example, I might have a trans man as a patient who's a, who is a um, teen, I'm thinking of a specific patient in my head, who is only sexually active with a man, but it's a trans man, so does not have a penis for genitalia, so I do not have to worry in that case about birth control or contraception. But I think that's something that's very important to ask and address. I think it's important to address with your patients, your staff and your colleagues to address folks by preferred name and pronouns and how you're gonna document that in their chart. Um, what I do in terms of my medical records is we'll talk about the process later for changing gender markers on your health card, but I keep the gender markers what it is on that person's health card and I just tell them that I'm going to do that because otherwise labs and prescriptions can float around in my electronic medical record or they can have issues filling prescriptions. Um, and I just tell them that and when you change your gender marker, let us know, show us your updated health card and we'll change it for you because you don't want labs to float around in my EMR because that can lead to a delay in me or my colleague covering for me reviewing it. And there is in some electronic medical records another option for gender, but then sometimes you do run into that floating labs issue. So if somebody tells you that they think they're trans and this is one of the first times they've told somebody they're coming out to you. I think it's important to be open-ended and gentle, to ask how you've described your gender, how long they've had thoughts, what pronouns and names they are the right names for them at this time. You might ask about behaviors like tucking, dressing, and play, and what they have thought about so far in terms of transition. I think that because the trans community has had to support themselves, a lot of my patients come to me having already read a lot online, discussed in forums, or read from medical sources or community-based organizations a lot about transition. So we'll already have a pretty good idea about risks and benefits of hormone therapy or surgical procedures and know what they're interested in. So again, I think it's another really important place to acknowledge and recognize our patients or clients' expertise in their own life and experience. I do think a mental health screen is important. Siggy caps is the acronym we use in medicine for the DSM criteria for depression. Um, sleep, interest, guilt, energy, concentration, appetite, psychomotor, agitation, or retardation, and slowing. But to have a diagnosis of depression, you have to have at least one of the two cardinal symptoms, which are anhedonia or lack of motivation, as well as no mood. 
Other mental health screens, an acronym we use in medicine is the HEADS, which has like 20 S's. I see a couple med students in this presentation, so you can tell me later how many S's are on HEADS now. Um, but that means home, education, drug, school, sex, or extracurricular activities can be one of the A's. It's one of those acronyms where it's almost more work to remember the acronym than what it stands for. Um, and then with any mental health screen, I would ask about symptoms of anxiety, psychosis, mania, um, you might ask about eating disorders and then suicidal ideation as part of the depression screen. Um, and then you might ask um, if somebody comes out to use trans about their partners, their supports and anticipated challenges to transitioning and also who else they've told so far because of course that's part of supports. Further evaluation, depending on the age of the person. So basically if they're 14 or less, you as a physician or nurse practitioner might want to assess their stage of puberty by doing Tanner staging, which of course is a sensitive exam involving chest and genitalia. So you might not wanna do that on the first visit. And of course, it's very important to do proper draping, allow chaperones, a support person in the room if they want and to warn them and prepare them that that's something you're gonna to have to do. Um, do some baseline blood work and I'll talk more about risks and benefits and why you would do those blood work later. And then plan, you no longer have to see a psychiatrist, just a qualified mental health professional, could be a counselor, a psychologist, or a doctor with mental health as part of their scope of practice or nurse practitioner prior to starting hormone therapy. But if you think, essentially, if you think they need a psychiatrist otherwise because of a mental health diagnosis or potential mental health diagnosis, then that's something to consider. And again, Samra Salu and Regina or Sarah Dundee in Saskatoon. Gamey banking, I will talk about that more later, is a huge consideration, as well as referring to local support groups, other trans people, mentors, and your role as a healthcare provider might also be to help facilitate family or support people conversations. So gender dysphoria is still a diagnosis in the DSM-5, which came out in 2013, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders. Um, I would note that homosexuality was in the DSM until the 1960s, I believe. Um, and essentially, though, gender dysphoria is that sensation. When people talk about it, they also often mean that sensation of discomfort that interferes with function of having a gender different from the gender assigned to you as birth. And that sensation of discomfort around primary or secondary sexual characteristics associated with that gender assigned to you at birth. Um, what it's defined as in the DSM is a marked incongruence between one's experience to express gender of at least six months duration. And then it's kind of, it's really pretty common sense in what you would sort of expect for both for children and for adolescents and adults, but a strong desire to be of that gender, um, a strong desire for the primary and secondary sexual characteristics, etc. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the World Health Organization recently came out with the new ICD-11 or International Classification and Diagnosis of, of Disease, and they now call it gender incongruence. The uh, main difference is that it's two years, but it's kind of a move to depathologize um, away from dysphoria and more towards, yeah, this is gender diversity and it's a, within the range of normal. And again, I think a fairly common, uh, common sense type of diagnosis, both for children and then adolescents and adults. So trans network, I think is a pro um, important to address in Saskatchewan. So people may have heard of Dr. Bellows. She retired in 2018, but her uh, registered psychiatric nurse, Kelly, that worked with her is still following the few patients that Dr. Bellows uh, referred for gender affirming surgeries in Montreal. I've already mentioned Dr. Stungable and Salou. In Regina, we've got Dr. Tom Peron at Queen City Medical Specialist that'll see people for hormone therapy who are 16 and over because he's a general internist, so only sees adults uh, by referral from a walk-in clinic, a family doc, any other doc or a nurse practitioner. Family docs, um, myself and 
my dear friend, Dr. Lori Schramm at the Family Medicine Unit run an external trans consult service. Unfortunately, I have, I no longer have capacity to accept more family medicine patients, including folks who are trans and gender diverse, even though I did accept um, several dozen patients as full-time family med patients who are trans and gender diverse at, when I first started my practice. Um, people can actually just call our clinic 766-0444. They have to disclose that's why they're calling and reception takes their information and then we arrange an appointment for them. And right now we're doing most of those appointments virtually. And those can be for hormone therapy or gender affirming surgical referrals. In Saskatoon, these are the docs that I'm aware of. The doctors Holler Holland, Addy, and Ruddy are still running that external trans consult service out of West Winds. And in Moose Jaw, I know Dr. Kirstie Sanderson is interested, and we are working on building our network, training residents to do this, and expanding. Um, for plastic surgeons, for gender affirming chest uh, reconstruction surgery, so these are for people on the masculinizing spectrum or non-binary people that want mastectomy or chest contouring surgery. We've got doctors Kozan and Lyons. Oh, and they, their office has moved now. They're in Regina who see people by referral as well as Dr. Peter Chang also in Regina. That surgery, you just need to refer the way I'd refer anybody to Dr. Lyons, say they had a broken finger with an intraarticular fracture that needed a plastic surgery follow-up. So you don't need to go through a double surgical referral process or anything like that, like you do for out-of-province gender-affirming genital surgeries. Um, and same deal with Dr. John Teal in Regina. There's people who are non-binary or on the masculinizing spectrum that would want a hysterectomy. And Dr. Teal, you would just refer to him in the, he's a gynecologist, you would just refer to in the regular way for that. So next audience participation question, there are three sort of broad categories of types of transition. There is no prescribed way to transition and some people will wanna do these at different rates based on what works for them in their own life or just certain parts of this transition. Um, so what are the three types or broad categories? You can throw it into the chat. Oh, okay, yeah. Good, social medical. Legal, I would argue, is part of social, but we'll talk about that. There's one more that I'm thinking of. And I suppose social and met, uh, the third thing is sort of my thing. Yeah, surgical, thank you. That's sort of a part of uh, medical. So first of all, social might be pronouns, dress and appearance. And then I include legal transition like gender marker on your ID as part of social, but maybe that's because I'm a doctor and not a social worker or anthropologist or anything like that, because I separate out surgical. So. Um, medical could be puberty blockers or hormone therapy that I talked about and then surgical or as so-called top bottom and then other surgeries. Um, medical and surgical therapy. So puberty blockers is Lupron or luprolide acetate. It's an irreversible gonadotropin releasing hormone analog. So it grabs onto your gonadotropin releasing um, um, or gonadotropin receptors and doesn't let go. And so that means that people, it, it basically puts pause on puberty and it's thought to be fully reversible. Hormone therapy is thought to be partially reversible. I'll talk about that in a moment. And surgery, of course, is irreversible. Um, in terms of social transition, how a healthcare provider can support health cards and birth certificates. So eHealth SASC has a good um, sex designation informative page. The patient has to write their own letter that has to be notarized and then they have to pay 60 bucks to eHealth. And then they have to bring in a letter that has this wording. This is actually the screenshot of the template I use from my EMR um, at eHealth Saskatchewan. Puberty blockers, like I said, they are fully reversible. They put pause on puberty. And uh, per the World Professional Association of Trans Health, they can be for anybody under 16, but usually puberty is sort of progressed too much by that point to do, to initiate blockers. But basically people have to be Tanner stage two plus, which means they have started puberty, but there's, they can't be Tanner stage five. So there still has to be some puberty left to block. So it's Lupraline or Lupron injections also used in other medical conditions such as severe endometriosis. Um, every one month and then you can space them out to every three months at a higher dose once they're stabilized on that and you continue probably overlap by six months to a year um, until or until a trans boy starts testosterone or a trans girl has orchiectomy or removal of the testicles um, 
And here's a key reproductive consideration is that I did a lit review for this presentation and it is not well studied, but you may, you may not develop enough gonadal tissue to support your own biological pregnancy if you go straight from blockers to hormone therapy, right? Because you have never gone into the puberty of that biological sex or the sex assigned at birth. In terms of feminizing hormones, this is the chart from the Sherburn guidelines that's great for all med students, nurse practitioners, if there's any family docs out there wanting to prescribe. Um, Sherburn guidelines really walk you through very beautifully how to start, how to titrate, and then what blood work to order baseline in for monitoring. Um, the patch is not generally covered. The gel is not generally covered. Injectable is compounded and not generally covered, but I have a couple patients on it who prefer it. So you're on estradiol. Um, and then also you go on a, sorry, I cut it out of my table, a testosterone blocker, um, which is either cyproterone acetate or spironolactone. I find that estradiol injectable suppresses testosterone on its own quite quickly. So often people don't need blockers, but those are the two blockers that we use. I do not generally prescribe progesterone. Um, there's some thought that they may contribute to breast or nipple development, but then increased risk of clot and low mood and studies to date have shown that they probably do not actually help with breast development and so are not generally recommended. But through an informed consent discussion, I do have a couple patients on it that have requested it. Feminizing hormone therapy monitoring. So when you think about side effects, sorry, I'm gonna jump ahead here of hormone therapy. For feminizing, um, there are risks of mood changes, although we know overall mental health outcomes get better, as well as liver and kidney stress and blood clot in the leg and the lung, as well as other clot or cardiovascular risks. They're a little bit more, uh, um, DVT and PE or blood clot in the leg or the lung are more common in the literature. Heart attack stroke a little less so for folks on feminizing hormone therapy. Then you think about what blood works, so complete blood count, liver functions, diabetes screen, and uh, cholesterol profile, which sort of accounts for your overall risks, as well as liver and kidney functions. You monitor for testosterone. Prolactin is that lactation hormone that estradiol can make go up. And then of course, STI screening is a consideration. Bloodborne and STI screening is a consideration for everybody. In terms of expected effects, um, Hormone therapy, feminizing hormone therapy, unfortunately, does not change the voice. So people sometimes go through speech voice training, either on their own off YouTube or with a speech pathologist to raise the register or timber, sorry, if there's any vocalists out there of your voice. Um, but body fat redistribution, muscle mass strength, skin and hair changes, decreased spontaneous erections, but erectile dysfunction being variable breast growth, testicular volume, decreased sperm and body hair. So breast growth, testicular volume and decreased sperm production are the ones that are potentially irreversible, although do not rely on feminizing hormone therapy as contraception. And I think that's very, it's so it's important to advise people about to start this of both, which is that you may have potentially irreversible infertility because the prostate and testicular changes may be irreversible, but do not rely on this as contraception. There's some really excellent handouts, again, at the end of the Sherburn guidelines that are publicly accessible to that I have a link to at the end of this presentation. That's like a, it's called a patient checklist. They used to have them as consent forms, but then it seemed a bit silly to have people sign consent forms for hormone therapy only when we don't have people sign consent forms for other very life altering medications that can be more dangerous and life threatening like blood thinners or beta blockers in medicine to start those medications. So now it's just a checklist and an informed consent discussion that I or your healthcare provider would document. Masculinizing hormone therapy, usually we go with injectable testosterone which can be done either intramuscularly or under the skin like insulin. Um, should be equally effective both ways. That is what's covered in Saskatchewan. The patch and the gel are not generally covered. So usually people end up giving their own injections every one to two weeks. Um, but the gel is covered by NIHB or non-insured health benefits for folks um, with First Nations or Inuit status with a treaty card or number, which is great. A treaty card as they call it. Um, in terms of side effects, so you again think about heart attack, stroke risk, liver dysfunction, mood changes, polycythemia is an increase in the red blood cell count where your blood is essentially too thick and then abnormal uterine bleeding are the sort of main risks. And so you think about ordering those same, very similar really baseline and then over time and you target both to the body effects that the patient is happy with and reporting and a testosterone in the mid-male range. 
um, these are the effects on masculinizing hormone therapy. And I've starred the ones that are irreversible. So the voice drops tends to drop quicker than that. I would say more like two to three months can be irreversible. The clitoral enlargement can be irreversible. For infertility is also potentially irreversible, but do not rely on this as contraception and testosterone can be teratogenic, which I will talk about more in later slides. Risks we talked about. Surgical referrals, so we talked about masculinizing chest surgery um, with no additional communication. You'd refer them to a plastic surgeon the same way you'd regularly refer to a plastic surgeon. World Professional Association of Trans Health Criteria for those, although um, WPATH is expected to come out with new standards of care, new guidelines in the next one to two years is persistent, well-documented gender dysphoria, age of majority in a given country, but some of our plastic surgeons will do 16, not 18. Um, stable mental health and capacity to give informed consent. Hormone therapy is not a prerequisite for, um, for um, chest surgery or for hysterectomy. Feminizing chest surgery, unfortunately, in Saskatchewan is still considered to be a cosmetic procedure, even though it is not, um, and so is not covered. And is like any elective breast um, augmentation. Um, same as for a cisgender woman, unfortunately. Hysterectomy and orchiectomy, um, same referral processes and coverage as chest surgery, as I've previously mentioned. Orchiectomy being removal of the testicles for somebody on the feminizing spectrum, especially if they may not want vaginoplasty. And then vaginoplasty and phalloplasty are out of province gender affirming surgeries that are right now Saskatchewan patients are only covered to go to the GRS clinic in Montreal. There are emerging clinics in Toronto and Vancouver, but right now they are not taking out of province. Um, surgeries. So to be approved for this by the Saskatchewan government, you have to have one psychiatrist and one surgical approver that can be either doctor, and it can be any psychiatrist and then any one of these um, surgical approvers, including myself and Dr. Schramm at the FMU. And then the criteria by the World Professional Association of Trans Health is that you've been on hormone therapy and socially transitioned for a year if hormone therapy is medically appropriate and appropriate to your gender goals. And of course, that you're a stable mental health age of majority and that you have the capacity to give informed consent. So when you may end up talking to somebody who's going for one of these surgery approval visits and they might say, well, what's that healthcare provider looking for? And they might be worried about it because of course this is a huge deal in their life. And it's that my clinic sends out an introductory letter for my surgical approval um, clients so that they know what to expect. And that this is the WPATH criteria I'll be looking to fulfill as part of that visit. Often I'm able to do that for surgical approval in one visit um, if they clearly meet the criteria, but sometimes if their mental health is unstable or if I'm worried that they don't have, um, they haven't fully researched or considered the implications of the procedure for their own life, I might make them do a follow-up with me. And we talked about GRS and facial feminization and tracheal shave or other um, trans-related surgeries that people might be in, interested in. The Face Institute do them, does them in Saskatoon, um, Dr. Rick Jaggi, but they are not covered, unfortunately. And coverage for what's covered for trans or trans-related surgeries varies by province. Preventative screening, um, you want to do a bone mineral density basically for everybody on hormone therapy over 50. PAPs for trans men, according to routine surgical or um, guidelines for cis women, if they still have a cervix. Um, some studies show decreased provider knowledge. In fact, we did a survey of um, SASC family docs, family med residents and nurse practitioners. And I think 8% of people we surveyed thought trans men didn't need PAPs ever. Um, they do. You may consider topical estrogen for a week before if they'll accept it because they can have vaginal atrophy and, and dryness there or just use tons of lube and let the patient go at their own pace for that. Mammography is indicated for trans women and men essentially per the routine guidelines for cis women. And if a trans man has had a masculinizing chest surgery, then he does not need a mammogram unless he's had breast cancer or very, um, or very high risk. And then prostate cancer screening is already not routinely recommended for cis men, but consider it for trans women with a strong family history or if they're of African descent, which is basically the same as for cis men. Even if a trans woman has had a vaginoplasty, she still has a prostate unless it's been removed for some other reason. Shared care, um, I'm happy to do shared care 
um, Tom Perron and then the other trans consult services. If you're a family doc or nurse practitioner out there that's interested to take care of your own patient and prescribe their hormone therapy long-term, but just you need a little support because you've never done it before. In terms of culturally safe reproductive health considerations, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about today, um, I think the language that we use is very important. People say that, you know, language considerations are too PC or too snowflake. No, what it means is that you respect that person's fundamental humanity and their human rights. So, uh, sorry, on that very charged note, some of the useful terminology that you might use is pregnant person safer language might be to use the gestational parent, the pregnant person, the dad, the carrier, people who menstruate, people who get periods, people who are pregnant versus people who produce sperm. Um, instead of saying biologically male or female, you might say a cisgender or a person who's not trans. You might say assigned male or female at birth instead of biologically male or female. You might say sexual or genital health, oops, instead. Outer parts for genitalia, front hole, I sometimes use for um, the front opening in people in trans men or people on the transmasculine spectrum. And so here's just some other ideas, chest feeding for instead of breastfeeding, etc. So key reproductive considerations. So all guidelines, as I stressed before, are recommended the discussion of fertility preservation prior to initiating hormone therapy, as well as that contraception discussion. You cannot rely on this for birth control, but there's a potential risk that once you start hormone therapy, especially for people on feminizing hormone therapy, that you may not be able to get to contribute biologically to a pregnancy going forward if you wanted to. Um, interestingly, some transmasculine people had believed and even been reported to be told so by a healthcare provider that testosterone functions as contraception, it does not. Um, we talked about the gametes in puberty blockade. And for this presentation, I did a quick PubMed search of transgender and pregnancy, which really shows us that there's emerging evidence in this area, 144 articles all in the past 14 years. Testosterone in pregnancy. So, um, People on the call might already know that testosterone is considered to be teratogenic or damaging to a developing fetus, it can cause labial fusion, abnormal vaginal development, persistence of urogenital sinus, as well as clitoromegaly in the fetus. And the Sherburn guidelines also note an increased risk of pregnancy loss. That's something I talk about when I talk about the need for contraception in people on masculinizing hormone therapy that are having sex with somebody who has potential to cause pregnancy. Um, stopping testosterone prior to or attempting to conceive is recommended, but the duration varies and is unknown, again, because it's not extensively studied. Anywhere I was reading in the guidelines from as little as, I've read in the guidelines from as little as four to six weeks to up to six months. Clomiphene citrate, or aka brand name clomid injections or beta HCG fertility injections may be required um, for infertility. So again, something to consider. I found a very interesting survey in my um, research for this presentation about transmask, uh, uh, it, when it was an online survey done in 2013, published in 2014, of transmasculine people who had been pregnant and delivered. Um, it was a convenient sample, and like many things in research, it was mostly white and American people who did this study. Um, 30, 88% of people who are pregnant in this study used their own oocytes or eggs. 80% reported resuming periods within six months of stopping testosterone, five conceived while they still had no period because they were on testosterone, 17 of the, 20, of the 25 people who were on testosterone um, previously stopped it or prior to becoming pregnant, 7% used fertility drugs, most conceived in the first four months of trying. Only, interestingly, only half had physician prenatal care and a much higher population delivered outside of a hospital than in the general population. And then there were no noted changes in this study, again, small convenience sample in pregnancy outcomes or complications from the general population. Um, there were qualitative findings to this survey as well, which, and one of those themes was increased isolation and maybe increased risk of postpartum depression, although they didn't do a full postpartum depression screen as part of this, like any questionnaire as part of this survey. Um, in terms of gender dysphoria, that was another prominent theme. Some people had more gender dysphoria during pregnancy and some people had less. 
And then interactions with healthcare professionals um, was another prominent theme, some of which were good and some of which were bad, essentially. Um, this was a participant quote, and I think that's a general really good quote for working with trans and gender diverse people in general, but also just people in general. Um, treat us as if we are normal human beings with normal bodies. And then some safe language was recommended as that I had in the earlier slide on safe language about recommended language during the pregnancy. Um, in, in merging reproductive technologies um, is potential cryopreservation of ovarian tissue. They're starting to talk now about leaving one ovary behind for bone mineral density purposes. Um, if a hysterectomy is done for a non-binary or transmasculine person um, who has a hysterectomy. And I, I hear that Dr. Teal in Regina is actually starting to offer that. And I've heard that other places as well. And there was a, at the World Professional Association of Trans Health Worldwide virtual conference, which I got to attend online in November, there was a presentation by Dr. Eliza Johansson, who is a surgeon who has done uterus transplants, which is very much an emerging technology. All of the uterus transplants she's done to date have been on cisgender women that have had some major medical issue that they were not able to uh, conceive otherwise. And, essentially, and it was all private and funded by research money. So is it a possibility in the future for trans women or trans feminine people? Sure, but I think we are a long way away from that right now, because right now it's just privately funded in a very select population of cisgender women. Okay, here are some references. Um, my references for the presentation. And like I said, these Sherburn guidelines. Oh goodness, sorry that that looks so funny, are publicly accessible. And for patients and the general public, there's some general resources. One of the biggest ones that I would point people to is the SASC Medical Transition Guide, which is hosted on TransASC. That was created um, by the SASC Trans Health Coalition. So I was part of creating that. And it talks a lot about risks and benefits of hormone therapy, surgical processes, and how to access care specifically in Saskatchewan. So that's a really, really important resource. Ministry of Health info page is important. Um, if you're guiding a person through trans-related surgeries, the Rainbow Health Ontario has some awesome surgical background or summary sheets that are actually intended for physicians and nurse practitioners. Um, the DRS Clinic in Montreal has a really informative website as well. They also do some private procedures like facial feminization and tracheal shape there. And it talks through the risks and benefits and aftercare procedures on the DRS Montreal website. So great place to look if you have somebody from Saskatchewan who's looking to get surgery there. Monarch Mental Health through Yard Pride I've talked about. And then we've got local organizations that run support groups. And then for service providers, there's WPATH and the Canadian branch CPATH. And then I've linked to the Sherburn guidelines and listed the other guidelines here. And the Trans Pulse Project releases little like information snippets and they're starting to do that from the, the data they collected in 2019. And they're definitely worth checking out at transpulseproject.ca because they have some of their presentations and posters there. Non-medical local support, we've also got Out Saskatoon. Out Saskatoon also publishes online a provincial queue list, which is a list of safe providers, and it might be healthcare providers, it might be lawyers, it might be commissioners of oaths for people who are trans and gender diverse, or um, gender sexually diverse otherwise, so basically part of the 2SLGBTQ plus community. Um, there's also Moose Jaw Pride that offers some rural supports. Um, talked about the medical transition guide and then Trans Umbrella Foundation and Trans Sask is running, has run support groups as well. Right now, you are Pride Annual is running a lot of their support groups online. And you can check all of that out at their website. And an exciting announcement. So I am actually co-principal investigator of a research project called Trans, Trans Research and Navigator. Uh, Navigation Saskatchewan, which is a really exciting project that stemmed out of the Saskatchewan Trans Health Coalition, which is that group of healthcare providers, most importantly, people with lived experience um, who are trans and gender diverse, people from community service organizations, Ministry of Health representatives. So that same group um, identified research as a priority and to improve health and health services in Saskatchewan. So what we're doing is we are currently interviewing for these navigators that we hope to start next month. Um, maybe we'll send out actually um, some information through some listservs and maybe even the SAS Prevention Institute because these people no longer yet have a website or 
um, cell or their phone numbers or their email addresses set up, but there will be a 30 hour per week peer navigator who will be somebody who is trans or gender diverse that will work with peers, clients and their support people, but also healthcare providers to link clients with health services in Saskatchewan. Their roles might be to tell, talk somebody through how to seek hormone therapy, um, potentially attending in-person appointments again with people if that ever becomes a thing again, um, as well as doing liaison work and presentations to healthcare organizations like this about, about trans services in Saskatchewan and providing trans and um, trans-friendly healthcare in general because of course trans people are people too, if there's one thesis of this presentation, um, who have, you know, my trans family medicine clients, it's not their hormone therapy that takes my time, it's their back pain and their diabetes and, you know, all of the other concerns that all people have. Um, and so it's a pilot project for a year and we're also doing baseline focus groups as well as post-service interviews and post-service um, and post-service uh, brief online surveys to evaluate the project. And so we're really excited about that. Any other questions or comments, feel free to email me. Do use my USASC email, please. And I'm sorry, I do talk a lot. Close though. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. That was a lot of incredibly informative information. So really appreciate you doing that. So we do have some time for some questions. Um, the first question, do you have any recommendations for how a professional can address problematic behavior among colleagues and coworkers in order to advocate for their clients? I agree with you. I think that is definitely something I've run into and we all run into and there's no perfect answer. A system is only as good as the people who make it up. Um, I would say just to challenge that a little bit, oh, what makes you say that? oh, if you're not comfortable providing, actually their pronouns are this, or actually their names are this, depending on sort of your vibe in the situation. There are guidelines on this that, and it is well known that our professional bodies like the Canadian Pediatric Society and the Sass College of Family Physicians and the Supreme Court support trans rights and gender diversity. Um, the other thing that it might be, might be a service navigation question. So it might be helping that client or encouraging your colleague to refer them onwards for gender affirming trans related medical care. That's really my best advice. There's no perfect answer. <laughs> I think very much related to that question. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to approach the top topic of gender and pronouns in a more rural or conservative setting? Uh, for example, I try to introduce myself following followed with my pronouns of she, her during clinical, but I'm usually met with confused looks. That's a great start. And when you're met with confused looks, just address that. Just say, I think that we know that gender diversity is common and I think it's important to acknowledge that. And they might say, oh, and it means something that you as a professional have brought that up and, and give that, you know, it's light and recognition. Perfect. Our next question. Um, hi, Dr. Clark. Thank you for a very informative presentation. My questions are around the diagnosis of gender dysphoria or gender incongruence. In your experience, do clients on their journey experience these diagnoses as positive and helpful or labeling and further stigmatizing? Is a formal diagnosis required for access to hormone therapy, surgical supports and services? Thank you. So a formal diagnosis per the WPATH criteria is required. Um, but I would say that, and I would say my experiences are mixed. Um, some people do experience this as stigmatizing and labeling. And as I mentioned, um, in the ICD-11, they're moving towards more gender incongruence and depathologization. Um, some people do talk about my dysphoria and, and I think identify more with that term or that experience. So I think it depends on the person and even people that like, I think it's pretty easy to tick those boxes but prior to starting hormone therapy, because you saw what the diagnostic criteria are. If you're a qualified mental health professional and you can, you know, make sure you're a psychologist or social worker or a nurse practitioner or a family doctor, um, you can tick those boxes pretty quickly. Um, and then I think the other thing is if you're talking about that diagnosis with somebody, it's important to bridge that 
it is right now in the guidelines and something that's needed before starting hormone therapy. And it's also something um, that's part of the guidelines for surgical access. So it's more a surface access question. Okay, our next question, what are the rules and regulations surrounding documentation or charting about a patient whose pronouns do not match their biological sex? I don't think there's actually regulations around it so far as I know. Um, I told you what I do, which is I make a note on the chart and the demographics. She, her, um, you know, patient uses this name, pronoun she, her. Um, I also put it as like a nickname in the chart as well. Um, unless until they've changed their name legally. Um, and then same deal for pronouns. And in certainly when writing the history, if you're writing patient says this, she says this, use their correct pronouns, i.e. the pronouns they use. <laughs> Perfect. Um, what does the literature say about the long-term safety of puberty blockers? Yeah. Are there any log longitudinal trials looking at these? Yes, so there are longitudinal trials looking at this, of the safety of puberty blockers, and generally they are thought to be safe. There are some concerns in the long term about bone mineral density, but the thought is that they do start to catch up to their age match counterparts when they start gender affirming hormone therapy um, for bone density. That's kind of the main one. All right. Um, and can the psychiatrist um, also be the surgical approver? For example, could Dr. Salu act as both, or do you need two different professionals? You need two different professionals for surgical approvers. But if doctor, if the patient is seeing Dr. Salu or already follows with her, then she can do that approver approval. Um, but they would still need a second person. But it could be Dr. Salu and then say me, even if they're not normally my patient, they could just see me as a one-off trans consult for that. And interestingly, it can be any psychiatrist and then one of those designated approvers, but you have to have two doctors, two different MDs. And the reason the Ministry of Health justifies doing that, and it's not like this in all other provinces, BT dubs, um, is that they say that it's the same as any out of province surgery. So say somebody needed some obscure ears, nose, throat procedure that our local ENTs could not prescribe they, or provide, they would actually require two Saskatchewan ENTs to apply for them for that, to go for that surgery in Vancouver or wherever. Um, although I would note that that's not the way the WPATH criteria are written. It can be two designated mental health professionals, um, which would include even non-MDs our interprofessional colleagues and um, many provinces, including Ontario, I have a review somewhere in my Google Drive, but many provinces, including Ontario, um, do not do it that way. All right, um, next question. I have a friend who is trans and in the hospital right now, constantly being misgendered and dead named. How can I advocate from, for them from afar, help them file a complaint? The hospital and licensing? If it was me, um, I would, I'm, first of all, that's terrible that that's happening to your friend. Um, we know that these experiences happen in healthcare and it's awful. Um, I would, if it was me, I would call the patient advocate at whatever hospital you're working at. And you also can, your friend can file a complaint directly with the College of Physicians and Surgeons, if it's the doctor specifically, or with, you know, whichever professional licensing body such as the SRNA, if it's a nurse or a nurse practitioner, or, yeah. Thank you. And um, our last question, um, I am a doula. What would you say is the most common concern for a trans person who has birthed and how to best support them? Well, I do not have any of the over a hundred trans clients I have worked with. I have not yet had one that has um, carried a pregnancy. So from personal clinical experience, I don't know. Um, in that particular study, do look at that study slides, uh, this Light It Al study, um, take a look at it. If you're part of the U of S um, to, and take a look at these slides, because it looks like kind of gender affirming medical care was important to people in the qualitative findings. Okay, perfect. If there's one more question that snuck in at the last yeah, minute. Here. I'm so happy there's so many questions. Yeah. In 
Um, if a patient is recently moved from another province, um, is the process of them accessing medical or surgical transition more difficult or is the process the same once they live here? Um, it would be close to the same. Um, and in many other provinces, there are navigator programs that can help them find um, a provider for hormone therapy. Oh, yes. And sorry, assisted reproductive technologies. I can just look quick here. I actually failed to mention that. Thank you very much for reminding me. Um, right now, the only place I'm aware of for assisted reproductive technologies is the Aurora Clinic in Saskatoon, and you require a referral from a doctor or nurse practitioner to go. That's the only place I'm aware of. And it is quite expensive and totally out of pocket. Like to bank sperm for five years is about $2,000. And then to have oocytes or ova harvested and stored for 10 years or five years is about $10,000. So while I offer it to everybody, I have very few people take me up on it. And I just document that discussed or a referral client declined, patient declined, I use patient. Um, and that's why I, um, I do that. But I have had a couple people go in bank sperm. Wonderful. I think that's everything for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to share all of this information with us. It was absolutely wonderful. A reminder for everyone that has attended this presentation, that the presentation was recorded and Dr. Clark has said that we are able to share the slides as well. I'll be following up with an email that includes the slides and a link to this recording um, probably next week. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that we have another webinar coming up on February 25th with the Canadian Public Health Association on trauma and violence informed care related to STBBIs. Uh, so when you close this browser, you'll also be directed to an evaluation link. Um, completing these evaluations helps us determine the focus and format of our programming and allows us to better support you all as professionals in this field. So please, if you can take the time to complete that survey, we would really appreciate it. So once again, a very warm thank you to our speaker today, Dr. Megan Clark. Um, and thank you for everyone here who took the time to attend this webinar. Have a great day.